For months, the Me Too movement shed light on the realities of being a woman in Hollywood and across lots of other industries. The latest executive thrown into the spotlight, CBS president and CEO Les Moonves. He's facing allegations of harassment and intimidation inside the workplace. Moonves has admitted he may have made some women uncomfortable by making advances, but insists he has never used his position to hinder anyone's career. CBS is conducting a full investigation into the allegations. And it has been nearly nine months since the height of this movement. And now some are asking, has anything really changed in the post Me Too era? My friend Kara Swisher flagged this extraordinary New York Times op-ed, and the writer is here. Nell Scovell is a writer and producer behind the shows like The Simpsons, Murphy Brown, and Late Night with Dave Letterman. Those are some good ones. And most recently, the author of the new book, Just the Funny Parts, A Few Hard Truths About Sneaking Into the Hollywood Boys Club. She joins me now. All right, Nell. Where are we in post Me Too in Hollywood, a very, quote, sexy industry? Well, I hope we're not post Me Too. I hope we're just at the beginning of Me Too. And I think a, uh, awareness has been raised. And with awareness, you get education, you get empathy, and you hope that will change behavior. I don't see any s systemic reform since these, the news stories started breaking. And that's unfortunate because that's how you speed along, change behavior. And also, if there's one thing we've learned from all these stories, the system isn't protecting the most vulnerable. So if the system doesn't protect the most vulnerable and people say, as it relates to Hollywood, this is just how the industry works, honey, <laughs> you'll never change it. Right. I, there, there's an attitude that it's like office supplies. You know, everyone steals them, you know, uh, so it's OK. Um, it's not okay, and there are too often we think of warnings against sexual harassment as suggestions from HR. They're not. They're, these men are not crossing the line. They're breaking the law. You know, it's Title VII, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says it is unlawful to make sexual advances or um, request sexual favors. Well, they said that no one would go to bars when they stopped allowing smoking in there. Last I checked, <laughs> bars are packed right here in New York City. All right, there was a moment that sparked you opening up about your time writing for Dave Letterman, and I want to show that clip. The creepy stuff was that I have uh, had sex with women who work for me on this show. Now, my response to that is, yes, I have. <laughs> I've had sex with women who work on this show. So that was funny to his audience. I can't imagine what it was like for people who work there. CBS issued a statement after saying Letterman's comments spoke for themselves. What did they say to you? <laughs> well, I had worked on the show in 1990. Um, I was the second woman to ever write for, for David Letterman. And um, look, no one who ever worked on the show was surprised by those comments. Um, and I did speak out at the time. I wrote a, an article for Vanity Fair about um, the uh, harassment I witnessed uh, at the show. It was a hostile work environment. But it was pre, um, I worked there pre Anita Hill, so we didn't even have the vocabulary. Look, my, I just thought it was messed up. <laughs> We have the vocabulary now. The question I have, do we have the space to actually openly talk about it? And I want to share Dan Harmon. This is the creative community. He admitted to his own wrongdoing during the height of Me Too. And I want to share uh, what was written. I crushed on her and resented her for not reciprocating it. And the entire time, I was the one writing her paychecks and in control of whether she stayed or went and whether she felt good about herself or not and said horrible things, just treated her cruelly, pointedly, things I would never, ever would have done if she were a male and if I ever had, and if I had never had feelings for her. You write that for every Me Too, there is also a You Too. Can you explain this? Because many people think, I don't even want to hear from these guys. They should say nothing. Well, I actually think it's very admirable that Dan Harmon said that. There are some women who, who say this is a time for men to listen. I disagree. I think this is a time for more conversation. I think men should feel safe to say, I'm not sure I did the right thing. Or, you know, was, was, but just for a minute, is it admirable to come out and say I did it? Or 
Is he just playing a smart game of crisis management because you know that train's about to run you over? Well, I, I think the cover-up is what, you know, it's the old AIDS um, slogan of silence equals death. I think you have to speak out about these things. Um, and, you know, we've got all this screaming in our heads so, <laughs> until it gets let out. Uh, the... Um, this behavior will continue. Have we made Me Too too much of a black and white issue that men who are in power, even if they're not personally involved in Me Too, they're simply afraid to touch it? It's a toxic subject. It is, and, and uh, that's where you don't get the education and you don't get the empathy. Um, so right now we have journalists are, are really performing the role of Hollywood's HR departments. And so when is it going to come, become internal and when is the industry itself going to um, pay attention? Well, HR departments work for the company, the company that's run by the man. But it is so important that we open up this conversation because we make it so black and white. You're gonna, one side of us is going to end up on the wrong side. And you know who runs everything right now? Yeah. Mostly dudes. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.